Akshara Brahma Yoga. This is chapter 8, Attaining the Supreme. Okay. So let's see, but first, uh, obeisance and prayers to Sri Sri Radha Govinda, Temple Deities at Iskon Mangaluru, and uh, respects and obeisance to Srila Prabhupada, uh, Spiritual Master, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine, Nair Vishesha Shunyavadi, Bhak Satyadi Sadarine, Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Atvaita Gadadra, Sri Vasadi, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. A quick recap of what we studied yesterday. Yesterday was chapter 7, right? So this is what we studied in chapter 7. Um, Chapter 7 was about uh, emphasis. Initially, we started off with the emphasis on the process about hearing, not estimating, not looking, looking but hearing about Krishna, right? Uh, that Krishna says is the best way of gathering information, right? Then Krishna tells us about the different opulences, his different energies, right? One, one who understands uh, the opulences and understands the position of Krishna, uh, and uh, what uh, it entails from uh, from a, a devotee, what is expected from a devotee is to surrender to Krishna. That is also what we saw yesterday. We also saw four types of people, right? Four types of people who don't surrender to Krishna and four types of people who do surrender to Krishna, right? And then we, of course, examined demigod worship, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, what is the um, purpose of demigod worship? Then uh, the matter ended with uh, how Krishna wants to bring everyone to him. And so he, he has plans of how to bring a person from de delusion to devotion, right? So that was the broad headings under which we had examined uh, yesterday's uh, chapter, okay? Now, today's overview is, uh, is a little, you have to uh, um, apply your mind uh, a little more today because today is a little bit of philosophy, right? Yesterday's chapter, Arjuna did not ask any question, right? So today's chapter, he's going to ask like eight questions, you know, trying to catch up with yesterday's chapter. He, that's because he was listening to Krishna's message, right? So when Krishna speaks and mentions something, he's not clear, then he asks questions, right? Now, one of the last questions, um, the last note on which the previous chapter ended was about how to think of Krishna at the time of death. If you remember, the last verse was that, right? How to, that Krishna says that even at the time of death, if you're, if you're able to remember me, Krishna says that, that will bring you uh, a liberation, right? Now, uh, because of that, because of that uh, response from Krishna, Arjuna asks these questions. There are totally eight questions that uh, Arjuna asks in this chapter. Right? Krishna answers seven out of the eight questions uh, till verse four. So by the time Krishna uh, mentions verse four, seven questions of Arjuna are answered. Right now, the rest of the chapter is about how uh, to deal with the eighth question okay so that is how the the uh, the chapter is laid out right? so eighth question is a very important question let's examine what it is and then uh, of course we where we have uh, remembering krishna by uh, yoga mishra bhakti yoga mishra okay mishra is means mixed right so here uh, yoga means uh, mixed with bhakti so that's pure bhakti shuddha bhakti also what is the result of remembering krishna at the time of death that is another heading on which we would be examining today's chapter. One goes to the spiritual world, but then what is the spiritual world? So Krishna is going to give a glimpse of uh, material world versus spiritual world, right? And then the supremacy of pure bhakti uh, is also dealt with in this chapter, right? So we start with the first, uh, firstly with the eight questions that Arjuna asks, right? So let's, uh, let's see what those eight questions are. 8.1 and 8.2, 8.1. Arjuna inquired, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Person, what is Brahman? What is the self? What are fruitive activities? What is the material manifestation? And what are the demigods? Please explain this to me. So that's the first uh, few questions in 8.1. Then 8.2 is, how does this Lord of sacrifice live in the body? And in which part does he live, O oh Madhusudana? And how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? Now, that last question takes up pretty much the entire chapter, right? Now, let's see how Krishna answers the first 
seven questions, right? Now, what is the reason for Arjuna to ask these questions, right? These reasons are raised by Arjuna due to Krishna's reply in the previous chapter. We saw uh, verse 29 and 30 yeah, yesterday, right? Let's just quickly examine those slokas because that is the, is the basis on which this, this chapter is, is, um, is laid out, right? So let's see what 7.29 7 and 7.30 say. Okay, this is yesterday, from yesterday's uh, class. Okay, so 7.29 says this. This is Krishna speaking, right? So intelligent persons who are endeavoring for liberation from old age and death take refuge in me in devotional service. They are actually Brahman because they entirely know everything about transcendental activities, right? And then 7.30, those who know me as the Supreme Lord, as the governing principle of the material manifestation, who know me as the underlying all the demigods and as the one sustaining all sacrifices can with steadfast mind understand and know me even at the time of death. Right now, this is the uh, this is where uh, this chapter takes off. Right when Krishna says that you can know me even at the time of death. Right now, these are the two verses from last chapter due to which Arjuna is asking these questions. Now, Krishna says, if you want freedom from sufferings such as old age and death, then take refuge in me. And how do you take refuge in Krishna? Through devotional service. Right. So Krishna also says that persons who surrender are on an elevated pedestal, right? Uh, because they know about Krishna's pastimes. We saw this sloka yesterday, 7.30. I, uh, I said that Krishna is merciful even if we think of him at the time of death, right? But then uh, the problem is, uh, it is difficult to think of Krishna when you are in the last few breaths, right? So if you have not thought of Krishna during the, uh, the entire life and made it a habit, then it is impossible to think of Krishna at the very end, right? That's how it is, it is systematically laid out, right? That, therefore, it is yesterday I was mentioning that the entire life is a training period for that last test, which is uh, on uh, when you have the last few breaths left, you have to think of Krishna, right? So let's just see it in a, in a tabular form that will make it easier to understand, right? So these are the questions that Arjuna is asking, right? So first, uh, uh, question is who well, what is brahman or uh, who is brahman and uh, krishna's answer is jiva that is the soul right so th the soul is the uh, is brahman and uh, we have also seen that the soul is an indestructible living entity right then that's the first question now second question is what uh, who is the adhyatma right the controller of the body and krishna's answer is it is the nature of the jiva which is the controller of the body right so, uh, and then, of course, we saw about karma. Karma is actions leading, which give you a material body, right? Good karma, bad karma, all these lead uh, to a material body. And then uh, his fourth question was Adi Bhuta. What is Adi Bhuta, uh, right? Material manifestation. Adi Bhuta translates into material manifestation. And Krishna gives the answer that it is nature, material nature, prakriti, that is uh, uh, Adi Bhuta, right? And then uh, he asks, what is Adi Daiva? Adi Daiva is Krishna's answer is universal form, which includes all demigods. We will be seeing that in, in the Vishwarupa form, right? In chapter 11, right? So that is, Krishna says, is Adi Daiva, right? And then uh, he asks, what is uh, Adi Yagna? Who is the enjoyer of, of all the sacrifices? And we have already seen this, right? Uh, this is uh, Paramatma. Paramatma is the only enjoyer of all sacrifices. And there's a specific verse also for this. We've already seen that verse too, right? That is, uh, was in chapter six, no, no, chapter five, right? And then uh, we saw uh, the next seventh question is, why, why, why does uh, Adi Yagna reside? And Krishna's answer is, it is in the hearts of all. So these are the six, uh, seven questions that uh, have been answered, right? All this has been answered quickly to, uh, in, in just two verses. So all these answers Krishna gives in just two verses. So by verse four, these seven uh, questions have been answered, right? Now, the last question is how to remember Krishna at the time of death. And Krishna's answer, straightforward answer is practice remembrance throughout life. And that answer, to give that answer, Krishna takes about uh, 25 verses, okay? So, let's, uh, let's just examine what uh, Krishna is saying, how he, he explains how to remember Krishna at the time of death, right? So this is 8.3. This is again just answering those seven questions, right? The Supreme Lord said, the indestructible transcendental living entity is called Brahma, Brahman, and his eternal nature is called the self. 
just give me one moment please i am uh, just give me one moment something bothering me Yes, thank you. Sorry, sorry for the uh, for the interruption. Right. So, eight point three says the Supreme Lord said the indestructible, transcendental, living entity is called Brahman, and his eternal nature is called the self. Right. So, two two of those questions have been answered. Right. So, uh, Krishna says that the living entity is called Brahman. Okay, and the soul is called is the is called the self. Right. Action pertaining to the development of material bodies is called karma. Now, the first three questions have been answered here. This is what we saw in the previous chart, right? So, uh, Brahman is the jiva, the indestructible living entity. Adhyatma is the nature of the jiva, which is the self, right? And then karma we saw uh, are, are activities which, which lead to a, uh, to a material body, right? So, all these uh, first three questions, Krishna answers in 8.3, right? Now, Sanskrit words sometimes change meaning depending on the context in which they are found, right? For example, in Hindi, uh, we say kal, right? Now, kal can mean both yesterday or tomorrow, right? But then it becomes clear only from the context, right? So, in this context, Prabhupada explains in the purport that Brahman has three uh, meanings. First, it is the soul. Second is the material nature. And third is the impersonal effulgence of Krishna or Brahma Jyoti, right? Now, depending on what context the uh, the word is used the meaning will change but in this context um, Srila Prabhupada says that Brahman means indestructible living entity or, or the soul right basically the soul because the soul is the one which is indestructible we saw it in chapter 2 one of the characteristics of the soul is that it is eternal right you cannot destroy it you cannot destroy it by weapon you cannot hurt it by weapon or uh, you cannot get it wet by water you cannot uh, burn it by fire all that we saw in chapter 2 right so uh, it is an indestructible transcendental living entity right that is the soul okay now krishna explains further he says the eternal nature of the brahman that is the soul is called the self okay and action pertaining to the development of these material bodies is called karma so the the uh, the, the next body that we are going to get is based on the work we do today right so if we are uh, if we are doing good deeds today you'll get a better material body the next time and that's why they are uh, usually human uh, body uh, being born with a human body is considered to be a very auspicious thing because it, it it gives you discrimination, power of discrimination, right? So with that power, it is that you can uh, you can decide what is right and what is wrong, and take active steps to reach the Godhead, right? Now people usually make a big deal out of karma, right? But then Krishna spends very less time explaining uh, karma uh, in I mean broadly speaking uh, in the overall scheme of things in in four point one seven. It is stated that the intricacies of karma are hard to understand, right? Now, we examined uh, that uh, verse in the context. If you remember, we, we, we also studied in the chapter about akarma, vikarma, and, and uh, karma, right? So, for this reason, Krishna does not attach too much importance to karma. But the problem is we are the ones who are attaching too much importance to karma because we feel it has more of a practical uh, application right but then where is the important message it is in the next six chapters right in in bhakti yoga chapters so therefore it is that this is the most important chapter because we have already seen this they, uh, the, the I, I gave you the example of of the 35th floor how do you reach the 35th floor if you're going to go by lift it is easier so bhakti yoga is is like the left right okay that is 8.3 let's proceed to the next one is 8.8.4 8 it should be 8.4 yes 8.4 Physical nature is known to be endlessly mutable. The universe is the cosmic form of the Supreme Lord, and I am that Lord represented as the super soul dwelling in the heart of every embodied being. Right. So this is the first time that Krishna is saying clearly that he is dwelling in the hearts of every embodied being. Right. So let's see. Uh, this is the next uh, few questions that, uh, that Krishna is answering. What is physical nature? Physical nature, that is Adi Bhuta, right? So physical nature, Krishna says, is endlessly mutable, right? Then uh, Krishna says the universe is the cosmic form of the Supreme Lord, that is Adi Daiva, right? And uh, super soul, Adi Yajna, where does he live? Krishna says, in the heart. Now, what does mutable mean? Because Krishna says physical nature is Adi Bhuta, is, uh, is endlessly mutable, right? So what is mutable? Mutable means changing, 
right? We can see that in, in, in everyday life too, right? Seasons are changing, trees are changing, everything material is subject to, to change, right? So it was Heraclitus uh, who said that change is the only constant, right? But even he was wrong because of course, uh, it is only Krishna who is, who is beyond change, right? So uh, even change is subject to Krishna, right? So the only constant is Krishna, not even what Heraclitus says, okay? So then uh, Krishna proceeds, I mean, explaining the, the verse further. The universe we are living uh, in is a cosmic form, right? Uh, is in the cosmic form, not in the transcendental form or the spiritual eternal form. Now, cosmic form is the universal form of Krishna. Again, chapter 11, we will know how when Krishna displays his, his universal form, the Virat Rupa, right? Um, the, uh, the universal form is manifested when the material form is manifested, right? Now, uh, if it, but it is not manifested when the material world is wound up. Now, uh, this, this winding up and, and manifestation depends upon Brahma's uh, days. In the day, it is, it is manifested. In the night, it is not manifested. That's why you get the partial destruction. Um, partial destruction and partial revival. If you recall, in chapter uh, 4, we studied about uh, the history of Bhagavad Gita. There we, we examined uh, Brahma's lifespan, right? So in that we, we saw about partial disting, uh, partial destruction. Pandya, we spoke about you, Brahma, if, if you all remember, right? So that is all from uh, from chapter four, right? Now coming back here, uh, Krishna says he is the Adi Yagna, that is the enjoyer of of all all sacrifices, which is and which is also the Paramatma, which is living in the hearts of all living entities. So by by the fourth uh, verse, Krishna has answered all the seven questions, right? Now Krishna turns to the last question, right? How to remember Krishna at the time of death? That is the most important aspect because there are consequences of remembering Krishna at the time of death, right? So let's see what the consequences are. But first, uh, let's see how to remember Krishna at the time of death. So we deal with 8.5. Hare Krishna, Madhavi. Hare Krishna. Screen, Prabhu. It's displayed on the screen, Madhavi. Antakale chamameva. Smaran Mukva Kalevaram Yaha Prayati Samadhavam Yati Nasyatra Samshayaha. And whoever at the time of death quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this, there is no doubt. Right? So, what is the consequence of remembering Krishna at the time of uh, when, when one quits the body? You attain Krishna's nature. And Krishna says that there is absolutely no doubt about it. So people who are living in Krishna consciousness are, are actually trying to pass this test. This is the only test that actually matters, right? So when we go to college school, we have to go through class tests, monthly tests, term tests, midterm tests. We have so many tests, right? But then it is the annual uh, exam, which is, which is the most important exam, right? Uh, you, you might have uh, done uh, well in the interim tests, but then if, if, uh, if one doesn't do well in the final test, then there is no promotion, right? So the word here, whoever is important, right? Because anyone can be Krishna consciousness. That's the second word, in fact, of the, of the, uh, of the verse. Uh, it says, and whoever at the time of death, right? So whoever is, does not, therefore, the entire Bhagavad Gita is not restricted to any class of people. It is, it is applicable for, uh, for the entire humanity as a whole. Right, because it's only humanity who can who have the power to discriminate. Right, so therefore it is that it it, uh, it applies um, across uh, across humanity. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's not classified to any section of the society as such. Right. Now these words of assurance, because here Krishna says, of this there is no doubt. Right. It's like a guarantee clause. Um, these words of assurance can, can only be given in the shastras. Uh, that there can be no doubt about this. Right. Only Krishna can give such an assurance uh, that there can be no doubt. When God gives you the assurance, then what more can we want, right? right. So that is uh, the consequence that I was mentioning about what happens when you think of Krishna at the time of, uh, um, of one's death, right? So what happens when, you, uh, when one thinks of uh, Krishna at the time of one's death? They attain Krishna's nature immediately. So it is placed at such a high pedestal that this important act of remembering Krishna at the time of death, right? So the moment you think of Krishna at the time of death, you one would uh, attain his nature immediately. And Krishna says there is no doubt in this. And we'll see a short story also about 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 this aspect. Okay, but first there's another story we I, I wanted to narrate. Okay, this is uh, from uh, Bhagavad Gita only. Uh, this is a story where towards the end of their vanvas, the Pandavas are in the forest, right, and they could not get water. 
So they searched all the uh, nearby places, but uh, they could not find water, right? So they were all very thirsty. Finally, Nakula found a lake, right? This lake had no, uh, interestingly, this lake had no uh, living entities in it, except for a crane. One, one crane was standing there and not the building crane, right? The crane as in the bird crane, okay? So uh, the crane warned Nakula, Nakula that uh, the water of this lake will turn into poison if he took it without satisfying the crane's questions, right? Now, Nakula thinks, what is this crane going to ask me questions for? I'm not going to uh, wait for the crane's questions and then answer them. I am thirsty, therefore I want to drink. So he ignored the, uh, the uh, statement of the crane and he ventured to drink the water, right? The water turns to poison and Nakula fell down unconsciousness. Unconscious, okay. So all the other brothers also come one by one looking for Nakula, then uh, uh, then um, then Sahadev comes, then uh, Arjuna comes, then Bhima comes. All of them commit the same mistake, right? They ignore the crane's uh, uh, questions and they drink the water, okay? And then they fall down unconscious. unconscious. So uh, lastly, Yudhishthira, having found that uh, none of the uh, brothers are returning, he himself goes looking for, for his brothers, right? Then uh, when, when that came, uh, he also found the lake and uh, he was about to drink the water when the crane issued the same warning, okay? But then this time Yudhishthira heeded the warning, right? And, and about 125 questions were put to, uh, put to Yudhishthira by the crane, right? And then the crane revealed himself to be a yaksha, right? So this set of question and answer session is called the Yaksha Prashna in, in Mahabharata, right? It's, uh, and one of those questions uh, in, in, in these 125 questions put by the, by, by, by the crane um, was, uh, what, is the, what is truly the most amazing uh, thing in the world? What is truly amazing in the world, right? And Yudhishthira gives this answer. So I'll just read this, uh, this English translation of that verse. Hundreds and thousands of living entities meet death at every moment. But a foolish living being nonetheless thinks himself deathless and does not prepare for death. This is the most surprising thing in the world, right? So, so many answers Yudhishthira could have given, right? But his answer was truly profound. We make so many plans for our everyday life events, right? Which, which may or may not happen, right? We, we make one plan, then we call it, then we make another alternate plan called plan B, right? And then we make another plan called B plus. Supposing that plan fails, then we can always have, we have a follow uh, fallback plan, right? But why is it that people are not making plans for something which is bound and certain to happen, right? And that is only a question of time, right? Why are we not preparing for death, right? So Krishna says, think of me when you die and hundreds, 1,000 scorpion biting. How will you think of Krishna unless you have practiced it for the entire life? This entire lifetime is the time which is allotted to a person to prepare for that test, right? And yet we squander it away on pointless endeavors, right? That's why, um, we, uh, that's why this, uh, this was a very important answer. And since it is related to, to Krishna's uh, um, instruction that you should think of uh, him at the time of birth and what happens when you think of him at the time of birth, you get to his nature. We saw it just in the previous verse, right? So this was one short story, right? And then we examine the next short story is from, uh, from uh, Bhagavad Bhagavatam. This is from the Mahabharata. And the next one is from Srimad Bhagavatam. This is um, about Sage Bharata, right? He was earlier a great king. And, uh, and it's based on him that uh, our land, our country is, uh, is called uh, uh, Bharat, right? So he was a great king and also a great devotee of the Lord, right? So he, uh, he renounced the world early and took up Vanaprastha, right? If you remember in chapter four, we dealt with the four kinds of ashrams. Uh, according to the uh, work done and also according to the stages of life, right? So, ashram uh, is... Please take care of your mics. Don't make me mute you all, please. Not proper. Right? Okay, anyway. Um, as we are saying... <clears throat> Uh, the four kinds of uh, of classification we had uh, about based on the work that, that is done and also upon the stage of life. So this Vanaprastha is a stage in life, all right? So which is almost the last stage, right? Now he took that last stage, says Bharata, he took that last stage early. He renounced his kingdom at, at a quite an early age, right? Because he was a great devotee of the Lord and uh, he renounced all his material possessions and uh, worldly pursuits and he retired to the forest. Now in the forest, he built a hut for himself and he started the life of a hermit, right? In, 
now uh, what happens he he was in the uh, in the highest just a little higher now see in bhakti there are nine stages okay just know this is just the starting class so beginners class so i don't want to go into the stages of bhakti just understand that there are nine stages in in bhakti right so one is higher than the other it's a hierarchical uh, ladder sort of thing okay now sage bharata was in the uh, in the second last rung of the ladder right he was in bhava bhakti okay now there's just one more uh, ahead one more uh, ladder one more step that he had to go and then it will be uh, uh, liberation uh, mukti right and he'll go back to the lord right now he is in the second last rung of the ladder which means a high high advanced stage of bhakti right it's called bhava bhakti by the way so sage bharata was at that stage right and uh, the final stage is prema pure love pure love for the lord right and he was going to go very close to krishna right but as time went by in the forest um it so happened that on on one particular day he uh, he sees a pregnant doe uh, come which comes to drink water in the pond nearby the hut of the stage right uh, hut of the sage right now uh, there was a lion also close by right so the lion caught wind of the deer and it gave a terrifying roar right now the deer is scared out of its wits it tries to jump the across the pond in 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 one jump right now it was pregnant also that doe right so the this this fright and the consequent exertion because of that fright in trying to jump across the pond made the deer to give birth then and there right but then um, it it was a birth by surprise right so it 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 it, it died soon thereafter right and now the the fawn the the baby of the deer uh, fell into the water now the sage was was just watching all this which was happening right in front of him and he was meditating and he was watching this happen right and he saw that the fawn had fallen into the water right and of course he's all mercy right so he picks up the fawn and he brings it back to his hut and he starts nursing uh, the fawn because he felt pity on it right and uh, because of his um, his compassion for the deer he rescues it right and and he 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 starts to bring up the deer right so it so happens that uh, the fawn thrived under the paternal care of the sage and it grew into a beautiful deer right but as time went by uh, the sage who was able to break away from from great attraction like for uh, from power from position from family he started becoming attached to the deer all uh, right and uh, he became fonder and fonder of the deer uh, the more he became fonder the less he was able to concentrate his mind uh, upon the lord right now when the deer goes out for example when the deer goes out to graze in the forest um, he'll start and and supposing it comes late to to the hermitage he starts thinking what happened to the uh, uh, deer was it uh, uh was it uh, did it face any difficulty was it attacked by some tiger or had some other danger befallen it right otherwise he he keeps worrying about the uh, this uh, this fawn which has now grown into a deer right so basically he becomes very attached to that deer right so what happens one day and that's in the next slide what happens one day the deer the deer uh, did not come at its usual time right and the, and sage was and sage bharata was uh, was very uh, very worried for the deer and he went he goes looking for it in the night right now his heart and mind were entirely on the deer right and he was worried as to what uh, misfortune could have fallen upon the deer because after all it's the forest right so um, there are animals here the predators there right so he is worried whether the deer might have been attacked by, by, by some tiger or a lion or something like that so right I, and and it was a very dark night that day that night was very dark and uh, the sage tripped and he fell down a, a, a hill right and and it was a very steep hill so he was severely wounded right now in his he was in his last dying breaths when this deer just ambles across and it starts nuzzling the uh, nuzzling the uh, uh, the sage like uh, like this picture is a wonderful representation of it he falls down the uh, the hill very steep hill and he's severely injured right this deer is near about that place and and it starts moving towards the the sage and it it nuzzles him with the with, with the snout right so uh, at that specific point of time all uh, that sage bharata could think of was that the deer was was safe right so he left his body thinking about the deer right now because his final thoughts were about the deer sage bharata though he was a great king and though he had given up all his attachments and he had retired to live in the forest and though he was in the penultimate stage of bhakti in the next birth he took uh, he took the form of a deer right and and this story from from shrimad bhagavatam relates back to what krishna says 
uh, about uh, thinking. The, uh, the, uh, it's what you think that is important at the last moment, right? Therefore, it is that uh, this, this story was relevant, right? And 8.6 is, is what Krishna says again about that verse. Uh, about this concept of thinking about what you um, thinking about Krishna at the time when the soul departs from the body, whatever state of being one remembers when he quits the body, that state he will attain without fail. Right. So Bharata at the at the last moment when he was thinking of the of the deer, he passed away thinking of the deer and he took the body of the deer right in his next birth. Now what happens thereafter is that deer though uh, though he took the body of the deer. He had accumulated sufficient uh, uh, karma, that good karma, that uh, that uh, he he, uh, he he was a jatashmara. A jatashmara means one who is able to recall the past, right? So the deer had had knowledge of its previous birth, so it knew that it was sage Bharata in the previous time. And um, sorry, just 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 give me one moment, please. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, the 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 uh, the, uh, the deer, which in the in the next birth, it it ha it was a jatasmara. As I was mentioning, jatasmara is a, is a person who is able to 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 remember the previous births, right? So uh, what happens? Uh, the deer uh, as dissociates itself from actually from from its companions, right? Like companions, like deer, like other deer. And it starts living near a hermitage. It's, it starts eating the leftovers of, of the sages in that hermitage and all that. And it dies eventually. Thereafter, it is born again as, uh, again with the name of Bharat. But this time it is called Jar Jada Bharat, right? And Jada Bharat gives a wonderful philosophical discussion with the king. That's, that's, a, that, that's another story. It, it doesn't come in this course, but you have it in level two, right? So it, uh, th there is a discourse between uh, Jada Bharat who, who doesn't talk to anyone, right? So he's called Jada because he doesn't talk to anyone. So people think he's stupid, right? So it so happens that one day he, he's interested in the work of carrying the, the palanquin of the, of the king, right? And uh, he trips and uh, he, he doesn't carry it properly. And uh, the king chides him very severely, right? And then he tells uh, about uh, certain philosophies and the king was also a devotee. So there's a deep conversation between both of them, right? So Jada Bharat and the king. And that is another very significant portion of, uh, of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. But that all comes in level two, right? They're just giving you an introduction, right? So we've seen now what 8.6 is. Now, the, the, what is the broad concept that we have seen from these two verses? Importantly, the point is this. The point is to avoid attachment, right? And more importantly, in this context, the lesson is that we attain what we think about at the time of death, right? That is what is mentioned in the last two verses that we saw. That was now the story of Sage Bharata, right? Then we examine another story today. So this is also a, which has an impact because of what happens at the time of death. Now, this is the story of Ajamila, again from Srimad Bhagavatam. All these stories are from Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam, that way, is a wonderful book. It, it explains uh, concepts, complicated concepts by way of stories like these, right? So it, we saw the story of King Nriga also. That was also from Srimad Bhagavatam. So all these uh, this deep concepts, right, which which is not easily understandable, are, are explained in Srimad Bhagavatam by way of stories like these, right? Now, now let's see, see the story of Ajamila. Ajamila's story shows you two things, right? First, how powerful the name of the Lord is, right? And two, the power of thinking of Krishna, right? So these are the two things that we have to understand from this story. Ajamila was a Brahmin, right? He was born in an orthodox traditional Brahmin family, and he was raised as a pure soul, right? He had learned the scriptures well and was capable of controlling his senses. Now, one day while gathering flowers in the forest, he happened to witness a beautiful prostitute in relationship with a drunkard, right? Now, he knows because he has studied, he knows he should not be watching, right? But then his mind says, just let's look for a minute, right? And nothing is going to happen. It's just for a minute. Just keep looking. Just look for a minute. Of, uh, let's look for a minute and see what happens. Uh, in, 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 in their courtship, in, in their relationship, right? So he hid behind a tree and he was watching, right? Now, by the time he returned home, he was fully engrossed in lust, right? And he planned to bring that, uh, that, that lady as a servant to his wife, right? So he went to the prostitute and he made a proposal. Right? He, uh, his offer was to come and live in, my, uh, in his house as a maid, right? She agreed. Uh, she has no problem. She, she, has, she says, yes, I'll come to your house. No problem. I can be a mate to your, to your wife also. No problem. 
but this is the amount of money that you have to give me and she calls an exorbitant amount of sum now he is very smitten with her right so he has no qualms agreeing to the demand right and so she accompanies ajamila to his home so that contract is done so she she is come home and she is working at uh, at at his place and uh, and he is going to pay her an exorbitant sum for that uh, for, for being the maid to his wife right but pretty soon it became evident what was going on between that lady and ajamila right so ajamila's wife is really peeved and his parents are very disappointed right so they left him ajamila's wife leaves him the his parents also leave him and he is now uh, in the house only with the uh, with that lady and himself right but now he still has to meet uh, the demands of um, meet her demands right and a brahmin doesn't come to get uh, an exorbitant sum of money very very often right so he takes to all evil ways so he starts gambling he starts stealing all that happens right now ajamila also has children with her right and uh, uh, because of his of his earlier good fortune when he did not change when he did not witness that act between that uh, lady and that uh, drunkard uh, he had done quite a bit of good karma right so by uh, by virtue of that karma uh, he names his last son as narayana okay and ajamila was very fond of of that particular the, his youngest son the, the last son right so he uh, whatever he wants he always says narayana narayana right so that way at least uh, somehow because of his uh, his earlier good deeds he uh, he has named his son narayana and and through that he has been chanting the last name irrespective of intention right so what happens as time goes by uh it was soon ajamila's turn to leave his body right now as uh, as the yamadutas came to collect him he was very scared because he had lived a life of vices right he uh, with this uh, with this lady right so he, so um it's not that he is going to go to heaven right so uh, it is the yamadutas who come to collect him they they want to take him to uh, to the lower planets right to the seven lower planets we have till patal lok uh, in 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 avedic literature right so there are seven uh, layers of uh, of worlds which are below us which are which are progressively worse right the the worst one is patal lok now he was so that ajamila was so scared when he when he saw the yamadutas that he started calling out for his son right he was narayana narayana right and as he was saying narayana he understood the futility of calling a small boy right because what is a small boy going to come and tell the yamadutas right so it was at that moment that he remembered what he was before he had fallen right before he had he, he had become who he had subsequently now no, since the last moment he had called out narayana the vishnu dutas also came right now there is a argument between the vishnu dutas and the yama dutas as to who can claim him right uh, the vishnu dutas won the argument and, and and this is a beautiful argument actually the, the, there is a narration of all his sins in the uh, that, that he had committed and uh, the the yamadutas uh, claim that uh, uh, for, for all these sins the the, the soul is uh, is uh, is rightfully ours and the yamadutas uh, sorry that is the yamadutas version now the vishnu dutas says all right all what you said is fine but at the end he had taken the lord's name and having taken the lord's name we cannot permit you to take him back to uh, patal lok right so there is a there's a huge argument going on between yeah, yamadutas yeah. and vishnu dutas mm-hmm. right just a second Okay, so I'm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, withdraw this liberty to unmute yourself. So I think only Suloshana Mataji can unmute herself. Other of you cannot unmute. So I'll 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 give back that liberty when we go to question and answer session, right? So still then let's uh, let's focus on the class, right? Okay. So what happens in this argument that transpires between Vishnu Dutas and uh, and Yama Dutas? Eventually, because he had called out Narayana Narayana at the last moment. uh the vishnu dutas win the argument saying on the ground that um, a dying person who has taken the name of the lord is not to be touched by the yama dutas right now the argument goes for a long time actually in the book that's a point made then there's a counter point the important thing was ajamila was conscious for the entire conversation right and uh, eventually they, they 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 take the matter to uh, to narayana himself uh, as to who is right right and eventually and and, and narayana says all right uh this has happened we'll do one thing we'll let him live a little longer and then we will see what happens okay so the point is uh, at that point of time when uh, it is at that point of time that ajamila understands that even though he had not 
uh, focused upon the Lord for his, the majority of his life, the mere fact that he had taken the Lord's name at the last moment had enabled the Vishnu Dutas to come to his rescue, right? So when, uh, when this conversation was going on between the Yamadutas and the uh, Vishnu Dutas, he started realizing uh, his own sins. When, when that list of sins is given by the Yamadutas, he started uh, understanding the, the sinful way that he had, li he had lived, the wicked life that he had le led, right? And he was also struck by God's kindness that, uh, that even at the last moment, just because that he had called Narayana, he's, he is still being saved, right? So what happens? He, uh, he changes into a, uh, over into a new leaf, right? So he realized the folly of his ways and he settled in Varanasi to continue what he had discontinued those long years ago, right? Before he met that girl. So he then leads a pure life and he becomes a great devotee of the Lord. And finally, when it was finally time for him to pass, he is uh, received only by, by Vishnu Dutas. The Yamadutas don't come because he had made amends, right? For, for all that time that he has spent in his evil ways, the rest of the life that he has given, he is uh, in a proper good devotee, right? So uh, he has washed off all his sins and then uh, the Vishnu Dutas come. So as I mentioned, there are two important models, right? One is that you think of, of the last thing that you think is the most important thing and two, the power of the Lord's name, right? So these are two, uh, two, uh, two important points which emerge from, from the story of Ajamila. Again, Srimad Bhagavatam, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, book about, uh, about all these, uh, these parables like, uh, as they are, right? It's really beautiful. If, if opportunity, it's there in the, in the same website I showed you, right? Veda base. It's what nearly 20,000 verses, but uh, these are all, it's not like 20,000 verses of the same thing. There, there are different portions to it. So please do try and, and, and read. It's very uh, informative. Okay, <clears throat> 8.7. Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without doubt. Now, again, this is a, a guarantee that Krishna gives, right? You will attain me without doubt. Now, Krishna, uh, Bhagavad Gita, of course, is full of instructions, right? Instructions on how to live, instructions on how to work, and even instructions on what to think of when you die, right? But in this, Krishna makes it easier for us. He just says, think of me and do your work and you will attain me. It is as simple as that, right? You may ask how to think of Krishna while working. Uh, do we not think of other things when we work, right? Uh, how, when, when, you're, when you're working or when you're studying for that matter, uh, we think 101 things cross our mind, right? And we're not able to focus on, on, on what we're studying. That's where, that's where we can train our mind to, to wander to Krishna. Instead of wandering to other places, we can train our mind to wander to Krishna. Even if it wanders, it can wander to Krishna, right? And think of him even when we work or study. Now, the order of the verse is important, right? Um, a work is not coming first. Uh, in, in this verse, if you see, work is not coming first. Thinking of Krishna comes first. Work, therefore, becomes secondary. Again, another reason why Karma Yoga is not given that same high pedestal. As, as bhakti yoga is right now the other important aspect from this verse is what is uh, in red and then highlighted the uh, uh, highlighter over that right in yellow in the form of krishna right so we should always think krishna as a person right he is not some sort of a light or an energy or a sound god is a person right that will be clear two verses down the line right uh, another verse also deals with this point. So you see, in the, in the spiritual path, it's always a relationship with God, right? You're going to have a relationship with Krishna. And when that is the case, what is the most fundamental thing of a relationship, right? You have to have two people in a relationship, right? It's, it's, it's delusional to think I can have a relationship with myself, right? So uh, Krishna says that he is a person, a, a person with a specific form. He's, he, he talks of his transcendental body also, right? We've examined it in the previous chapters also, Krishna's transcendental body. So understand this, that it's, uh, you shouldn't, one shouldn't think of, uh, of Krishna as, as a source of light or as a source of energy or, and all that. That is uh, a more in, impersonal form of it. And um, in the Bhakti Yoga chapters itself, another chapter down the line, probably tomorrow, we will uh, see specifically Krishna explaining what is the difficulty when you think of Krishna as a light or as a, as a way of, um, of an energy? Krishna says that will uh, that is not the way authorized way meant for embodied souls. We are we are all embodied souls, right? So, Krishna says you should think of me as a person. So that is how we should think of person. He is a he's a person with a body, right? So be very clear about that. Okay, so that is about eight point seven. 
Then we go to 8.8. He who meditates on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated from the path, O Partha, is sure to reach me. Right? So it takes constant meditation on Krishna to go to Krishna. Right? So when we love someone, we keep thinking of them all the time. Right? So how do we express our love for Krishna? We do that through devotional service. So the moment generally in, in the material world, when you say you love someone, immediately strings are attached, responsibilities are attached, right? But when you say, I love Krishna, then all those attachments fall away, right? I've, I've mentioned this before, right? So this, the object of this life is not detachment, right? It is attachment to Krishna, right? And detachment of other things, not a detachment from everything is attachment to Krishna, right? So that is the object of life. That's what this, this verse says. You have to think and be in, in thought in constant meditation of Krishna, right? Because that is how you love, it, it comes automatically. When you love Krishna, his thoughts are always in your mind. It is, it, it is like how, um, uh, how, how lovers are generally, right? Uh, a person uh, falls in love with, with another and uh, that uh, love brings that person's thoughts over and over again to, uh, to the other person, right? So that is what is dealt with in 8.8. .8. Let's see 8.9. It's an important verse. One who meditates, one should meditate upon the supreme person as the one who knows everything, as he is the oldest, who is the controller, who is the smaller than the smallest, who is the maintainer of everything, who is beyond all material conception, who is inconceivable, and who is always a person. He is luminous like the sun and being transcendental is beyond this material nature. Now, two things are important from this verse, right? And it's color coded for a specific reason because there are different aspects of Krishna which is mentioned in 8.9, right? What are that? What, what are those aspects? How do you meditate upon Krishna? Now, previous verse, we saw that you have to meditate upon Krishna, right? Constantly. Now, uh, how do you meditate upon Krishna is what is explained in 8.9. How do you explain about Krishna? You think about he, that he's a person who knows everything, right? He is the oldest, Premevel, right? So he is the oldest. Um, who is the controller? Who is, this, who is smaller than the smallest? Who is the maintainer of everything? And who is beyond all material conception? Who is inconceivable? And who is always a person, right? So all these are characteristics of, of Krishna. It's a direction on how to meditate about Krishna, right? Now, the last line, is, is also very important because here again, Krishna says that he is beyond this material nature. Why is that? He is beyond material nature because material nature itself is a, is a, is a construct of the Lord, right? It is, it is the Lord who has created the material nature. Therefore, he is not bound by, by, by those three elements, right? Sasvik, Rajas and, uh, and uh, Tamas does not ap apply to Krishna per se in, 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 in that sense. Or it doesn't apply at all, right? I shouldn't qualify it. It doesn't apply at all, right? Right. Now, another important aspect that I wanted to point out was what is in red there, right? And who is always a person. You, you remember a couple of verses ago, we had al already seen Krishna says that he, you should meditate upon him as a person, right? So he's emphasizing that point again in 8.9, that you should meditate upon Krishna as a person. Adokshaja, Krishna is Adokshaja, that is one who has eternal knowledge, right? And how is he reached? He is reached easily through bhakti, right? Not through the Vedas, not through Jnana, not through Karma, it is only through bhakti that you are able to, to reach Krishna and, and drive this point into your mind that it is only through bhakti that you can reach, reach, uh, uh, reach Krishna. Because that is what the Gita says, only through bhakti can one, uh, can one attain Krishna, right? Uh, it's, uh, other things are just uh, in, in aid of that bhakti, right? So bhakti is the main thing. So karma and jnana are, are aids which, which promote bhakti, right? So both karma and jnana have to mature to bhakti right? because uh, as they say, uh, knowledge is useless unless it matures into intelligence and intelligence is useless unless it becomes bhakti, right? So that is, we will see that also in, in, in a subsequent chapter. That's, there is a very nice speech by, by uh, Raja Gopalacharya, right? Uh, where he introduces Bhaja Govindam, but then that's another story. That's in another class, okay? So I, I'll play that, um, that, uh, that short uh, speech by, by Rajaji. It's about two minute speech. At that time, and I think we, we deal with it in chapter 12, chapter 12, yeah, but that's just the last chapter of the Bhakti chapters, right? Yeah, I think it's in 12. So I, I'll play it then, but that's a very beautiful speech. So we, uh, please do turn up for classes. We have 24 out of a class of 200 nearly. We have 24. That is not good. I, I wish more would attend because having registered, I don't know what prevents them from attending. But anyway, let's proceed further. That's 8.9 completed. 
and uh, this is of course all de pure devotees are meditating on on krishna because the last two verses we have been dealing with the importance of thinking about krishna on meditating on krishna right so exalted devotees the brahma shiva are always meditating on krishna and relish, relishing the the, the mellow right shrimad bhagavatam has specific uh, chapters dedicated uh, to to all the devotees who who uh, who, who are uh, of krishna right so uh, shiva is meditating on this sankarshana form of krishna brahma speaks in the 10th canto and he heaps praises on krishna krishna shiva appears in the 4th and the 8th canto of shrimad bhagavatam he teaches his wife uh, parvati about the glories of krishna so all this is in shrimad bhagavatam right okay so 8.15 we are almost there oh, but today we uh, today we also have to uh, look at the goloka chart right so that will take another 5 minutes in itself mamu petya punar janma dukhalaya mashashvatam napnuvanti mahatmanah samsedhim paramam gataha thank you mataji thank you okay uh, after attaining me the great souls who are yogis in devotion never return to this temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest perfection okay so what was i saying before i got cut off uh, okay anyway that's that that train of thought is lost um right so 8.15 right so you find that materialistic people um often they are suffering from this illusion of grandeur right they may think that they are leading a glamorous life right but let's see what the scriptures say about the quality of our life in kali yuga right shrimad bhagavatam has a very apt very apt um, um, uh, verse for this right uh, chapter 1 uh, it says canto 1 chapter 1 verse 10 uh it gives the 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 life that can be expected in uh, in kali yuga right so in the age of kali the verse says people would be would be manda bhagyas here that is we we would not be as fortunate as the people of the other yugas we will have alpa ayushya we'll have less life span and then we have manda smriti also which is less memory so olden days only hearing is sufficient but now unless you take notes unless you apply your mind you will not be able to uh to understand the message right so this is the quality of life which is mentioned in uh, in, in shrimad bhagavatam about kali yuga right and uh, yet we see with yet you you see materialistic people they think that this is a glamorous life right now krishna says about this world that we are living in he he calls it dukhalayam asaswatam right dukh is sad right alayam is a place so this place is a is full of misery we cannot find one person who can claim that he is misery free you take anyone sir madam are you happy you rarely get an answer yes right now most of the people due to a social norm they may superficially say yes they are happy but when you get to know them intimately uh, more in deep you would realize that they have their own uh, own own battles to fight nobody is happy in that sense right so therefore krishna says here that unless you you surrender to krishna and recognize that he is the master of the universe and he is the well wisher of all living beings you cannot attain peace right uh, sashvatam means permanent right so here asashvatam means impermanent temporary right so that is the uh, that is the purport of this uh, this shloka right so krishna says after attaining me the great souls who are in yogis in devotion never return to the temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest perfection so once you surrender and once you go back to krishna there is no returning back to this material world because the soul has learnt its lesson initially the soul wanted to enjoy right now that it has enjoyed and it has suffered and once it goes back krishna says your soul is not going to make the same mistake right so that is 8.15 let's proceed to the next verse 8.16 from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest all are places of misery wherein repeated births and deaths take place but one who attains to my abode o son of kunti never takes birth again right so generally what happens we we are given to understand that in swarga loka there is a lot of enjoyment right but we also uh, hear that wars take place so very often between devas and asuras right so you don't get to be at peace even there right so how can you be at peace in a war torn place is definitely not going to happen health we all know it, it is going to be a definitely a painful place so even heaven in, in that sense does not give you the uh, uh, the peace that is usually expected of heaven because there's a battle going on between the devas and the asuras anyway so the point is this any way you go up or you go down you are not able to break free from this four pangs of misery what are those five four pangs janma mrityu jara vyadi right that is birth death old age and disease sickness 
Right? So these are the four things which cause misery. Right? So it, it, there's only one place which does not have all this. Right? That is at Goloka Vrindavan. Right? All the other places, uh, whatever heaven you are at, all those seven uh, planets that are the seven planes which are uh, which are above us, or the seven planes which are below us, all of them are misery. Uh, are places of misery. Right? It's just a difference in degree. Right? You may not have so much misery as you have here, as in Swarlo Swargaloka. That's the only difference. Right, so you, the point is that you have to break free from this, from this uh, entire uh, uh, structure, right? And uh, let's see about this verse next. So this is eight point two zero. Yet there is another nature, which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested matter. It is supreme and it is never annihilated. When all in this world is annihilated, that part remains, right? This is a very simple uh, verse. There's no explanation required. Krishna's place is eternal and it is never annihilated, right? Uh, everything else is subject to annihilation except this place of Krishna. So what is this place? Any idea? Can you please tell me? I just mentioned the answer also. Uh, what is this place that Krishna is talking about? I, I just mentioned it a few minutes ago. Can you just type in the uh, in the chat box? Ah, perfect. Parul Sharma Mataji got it right. Goloka Vrindavan is that place, which is which is never destroyed. So, uh, as I was mentioning, Brahma's uh, lifetime is not is not for infinite, right? So he has a specific lifetime, 120 trillion years. We saw that in the uh, in chapter four, right? So when when the lifetime of Brahma uh, ceases, uh, lapses, and and it's time for the next Brahma to uh, uh, to come up into the scene, there is a complete annihilation of everything right now now we saw that there are partial anni annihilations also right in the night of brahma there is a partial annihilation right uh, th there is an unmanifestation of all the uh, all the worlds right and in the uh, in, in when, when it is day for brahma again all these are manifested now that is a, a partial uh, annihilation right we saw about sandhya again in chapter 4 right but all this comes to an end when the lifetime of brahma ceases right so that is there that is a complete uh, annihilation. Everything is uh, is is destroyed. Everything is is annihilated, right? But Krishna clarifies that there is only one place in this world which is beyond annihilation, right? And that is not just in this world, in the universe as it as it as we understand it, right? So in the universe, there is only one place which is not destroyed, and that is Goloka Vrindavan, right? That is Krishna's place. Now, speaking of Goloka Vrindavan, let's let's see the Goloka chart next, okay? If you thought about that, the uh, explanations for uh, for Brahma's age calculation was complicated. This is takes it to a totally different different level. Okay, so we are going to understand just the basics of it, right? Because this is the beginners class. Uh, this, this requires it, uh, at least a level four to understand it fully. So what I'll do is I, I'll I'll break this down into five stages. Okay, uh, so it is. I hope uh, by the end of another five minutes we'll be able to understand what. Goloka Vrindavan is, what Vaikundam is, what is our uh, present position, all this is what is going to be mentioned in this, this chart. Now take the left, left side of the chart first. Okay, let me just change the cursor. Yeah, so this left side of the chart first, right? that's what we're going to examine. Now, uh, Krishna lives in, uh, in Goloka Vrindavan. I've already mentioned that before, right? Now, this is a construction of both the material and spiritual world. This chart is a construction of both the material and spiritual world. Now, uh, as I was mentioning, Krishna lives in Goloka Vrindavan. Uh, here, that's uh, let me zoom in a little. Oh. Here, this place. This this is Goloka Vrindavan, right? So Krishna lives here uh, in his two-handed form, right? Now, when you look at the sky, you are able to see the sun, moon, and then a few planets also, right? With specialized equipment, we get to see more, right? That, that is the material world. Now, Srimad Bhagavatam says, just like this material world, uh, Goloka Vrindavan and Vaikunta planets are also circulating in the sky, right? And this sky is called the Brahma Jyoti. Okay. What is Brahma Jyoti? It is the effulgence that comes from Krishna's body, Krishna's body and his planets, right? So Krishna's planet, just understand it like this Krishna's planet is Goloka Vrindavan, uh, where he lives in his personal two handed form, right? That is point number one. That's stage number one. Okay. Where is Krishna? He is in Goloka Vrindavan. How does he look there? He is in his two-handed form, right? That is stage one. Now stage two, okay? Below Goloka Vrindavan is Vaikunda planets, right? This is where, this, this is that Vaikunda planets. Now this is where Krishna is in, in is present in his four-handed form, right? So uh, when, he, when he comes here, he has already 
expanded himself, right? So this is Vaikunda planets where he is like, I've told you this before also in class. He is in the mood of, a, of an office, office person. He's more serious. It's, it's all official work here. Whereas Goloka Vrindavan, he is more intimate, right? He, uh, he's more accessible, right? So in Vaikunda, it's all more serious, uh, all, all the more serious, uh, seriousness, right? So that is Vaikunda. So in, in Goloka Vrindavan, he's in his two-handed form. In Vaikunda, he is in his four-handed form. Now, what happens till, till here, there's no problem. That is stage two that, that I mentioned. Now, when we go to stage three, what happens is we come to creations, right? And when it comes to creations is when the problem starts. Because after from after Vaikundam, uh, Krishna expands himself, right? He expands himself to Balaram, right? Balaram expands to Shankarshna. Shankarshna expands to Kri uh, Kriyodakshya Vishnu, okay? Now, Kriyodakshya Vishnu's breathing is so powerful that it starts to create universes, okay? Ours is one such universe, uh, which uh, comes from Kriyodakshya Vishnu's breathing, right? So that, that is how Srimad Bhagavatam describes creation, okay? From the breath of Vishnu is what our universe is created. And, and like our universe, there are many, many other universes. So we, we subscribe as, as, a, as uh, the uh, science these days is very popular about multiverse theory, right? So the, the point is not universe, it's actually multiverse. This is actually now science this is a hot topic in, in the scientific field also, in, in, in science also, because um, there is some sort of an evidence that the scientists have been able to, to work out, to, to figure out this, uh, this aspect that our universe is not just the only universe which is in existence. There is a possibility that there are other universes also in existence, just like ours, right? But then we are very clear about it. We say when, when, when Kriya Dakshya Vishnu breathes, is, that breath is so powerful that it creates universes. Right now, that is how the creation actually starts. Now we go to our position here. Right now, that is given a little more detail here. This this chat will make it a little more clear. Right. So this is uh, this is uh, only the, like uh, if if you see this three stages here I've mentioned. Right now we are here. This is what I'm going to explain now. Okay. So that is what you'll get here. This is our position. Right now, half of our universe is covered by water. Right, and on that water, Krayodakshya Vishnu expands to Garbodakshya Vishnu. Right now, it is this Garbodakshya Vishnu from whose navel a lotus stem comes out. Okay, and on top of that lotus flower is Brahma. Brahma is born. So Brahma is Atman. Right, he does not need a mother to give birth to him. He directly comes from Vishnu. Right now, in the step, in the stems of the lotus, uh, lotus uh, that comes from Vishnu's navel. What happened? Mm, that comes from Vishnu's navel. You you find steps here, right? That the, these curves that you find here, those are the, uh, the those are the different uh, levels of uh, of planets. I, I told you about uh, seven above and seven below. So th those are the seven uh, fifteen totally fifteen steps which 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 form fifteen levels of uh, of planets, right? So as I was saying, uh, Brahma Brahma is, is from Vishnu. Vishnu um, Brahma doesn't need a mother. All that I've mentioned. And I've also mentioned about the uh, the lotus stem, right? That that comes from uh, from uh, from Vishnu. It is. I'm, we are now in stage three. Please understand that, right? So this is seven planets above and seven planets below us, right? So all, in all these planets, uh, Shiva Bhagavatam says there are living entities. So it's not that this 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 planet Earth has living entities. There are living entities in all the planets. All the seven lokas above, all the seven lokas below is filled with Brahma's creations. Now all these, all of us are created by Brahma. We don't directly relate ourselves to Vishnu. It's just through Brahma but that, that Vishnu operates, right? That is now stage three. Then we go to stage four now, right? Now stage four, Brahma Daksha, sorry, uh, Garbha Daksha Vishnu expands himself to Shiro Daksha Vishnu, right? Now Shiro Daksha Vishnu is the one who is in, in, in the hearts of all of us, right? Uh, that's why I mentioned earlier about the three kinds of Vishnus that are actually there. It's not just one, right? We have three, three, three Vishnus itself. Right. And Garbhodakshya Vishnu, when he expands himself to Shriyodakshya Vishnu, right, uh, he is the one who is in, uh, in all the living entities, in the hearts of all the living entities as the super soul. Right. So he is the Paramatma. He lives in the hearts of all the, all the living entities. Right. So this is uh, Shriyodakshya Vishnu. Uh, I've mentioned about Shriyodakshya Vishnu. That is stage four, when Garbhodakshya Vishnu expands to Shriyodakshya Vishnu. Now we go to stage five. Right. Apart from this universe, as we are able to see it, there are coverings also, or they are called Mahatattvas, right? And they have components, right? Now, each presiding layer is 10 times thicker than the succeeding layer, right? So all these layers are in the supervision of Mother Durga, 
Okay, so she is like a jailer, right? She's also called Vaishnavi, and she's a great devotee of Vishnu, right? So she's working on behalf of Krishna, right? So what are we now doing? We are trying to to go up this this ladder, right? We we want to go up this ladder because we want to reach Satya Loka, which is Brahma's Loka, where uh, you get it's, it's like this. See, well, uh, what is the difference between living on Earth and living uh, in Satya Loka? The difference is this: you you only get a cleaner plate. That is all. You in in Earth, let's say you are given a dirty plate. In in Swargaloka, you are given a clean plate. But the problem is, that is not enough. That is not the dharma of the soul. The dharma of the soul is to is to break away from from this this construct, right? This construct that is keeping us here. It's like a jail, right? We are in a jail, and we are, we are only trying to go up or we go below because of our activities, sinful activities. You go below. But if if you are if you are conducting yourself well, then you only turn up up. you go to higher planets where you get to enjoy a little more that's the only thing that happens and and if you uh, if if your past times have uh, have uh, have been completed if your uh, if that what do you say it's like a like a bank uh, account that you have right so you put punya as credit and when you expend this punya in that swargaloka you have to come back to the material world which is here earth right now the problem is this this going up and down does not satisfy the soul right the soul to satisfy the soul you have to complete its dharma and what is the dharma of the soul it is to go back to the original source and what is the original source krishna is the original source therefore it is that to go back to the original source there is only one way and that is surrender to krishna and bhakti devotional service and uh, be engaged in devotional service and what is uh, the way uh, to engage in devotional service do you see this white line here the, this white line which goes up i think it will be better visible here yeah, in in this uh, if it is uh, yeah so you 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 see this white this faint white line which goes all the way to uh, to goloka vrindavan that white line there is the maha mantra right so hari krishna maha mantra is the is the easiest way to render devotional service in order to break free from this construct which is re, which is retaining us right so it's not good deeds uh, and please understand this clearly it is not sufficient if you only do good deeds so manav seva madav seva and all does not serve the purpose of the of the soul what is the purpose of the soul the purpose of the soul is to go back to godhead right and unless you surrender unless you 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 do devotional service unless you are in bhakti you will not be able to break free from the from this jail in which we are in right so it is not sufficient if you do good deeds you will have to have bhakti also good deeds as i mentioned only gives you a clean up plate that is all it does right so that is a brief description of um, of goloka vrinda of goloka chart this chart uh, you, you see this uh, this description uh, on the left right this this place here 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 and here so what i've explained would be explained here in more detail we of course have uh, have very less time so i I've, i've sort of condensed it right this will make it a little a little clearer and we'll send you a, a clearer uh, picture today on the whatsapp group and please do read this because this really makes a very fascinating uh, approach to to cosmology itself vedic cosmology right so please try and uh, get time to to read this uh, uh, this uh, text which is written in the chat okay that will give a clearer understanding of the goloka chart what i have given is the basic outlay okay there is much more to say in detail of course all that is this is the beginners class right so this just understand this concept we can develop it further in the in the advanced levels right okay so we uh, go to one one more slide okay this is what happens in the in the spiritual world at goloka vrindavan right so krishna is interacting uh, with uh, with his devotees in different manners different past times goloka vrindavan is full of past times right because krishna is very intimate there right uh, no doubt devotees of krishna love him but then krishna loves him back he uh, loves them back Right, that the, there's a reciprocation of love in uh, in Goloka Vrindavan. It's not just one way. You see, uh, that's that that's why you see how how can a mother like uh, you? How can you be a mother of of Krishna, the 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 supreme personality of Godhead, and still chase him with a with a stick like like Mother Yashoda did? Right, it's all in love, right? and Krishna recognizes that in uh, uh, that that love of the devotee is always recognized by by Krishna, and and that is what transpires at Goloka Vrindavan. It's all full of pastimes. right and that that past time brings pleasure to both the lord and to the devotee and to the souls there right so that is a brief description of goloka vrindavan so just uh, two more slides and we will complete right this is the importance of chanting 
this is from uh, mukund mala stotra okay this is uh, written by kulashekar alwar kulashekar alwar is is one of the 12 alwars alwars uh, means uh, those immersed immersed in the lord right he was a king from the south uh, kerala portion he was chera uh, chera place right so chera now is uh, is kerala so what happens uh, shrila prabhupada uh, translated uh, his his works uh, king king kulashekara's works and this verse is from that work right this work book is called mukundamala stotra right and um, this is what king kulashekara is saying oh krishna please allow my mind to immediately yield to your lotus flower like feet just as the flaming flamingo enters into the labyrinth of the lotus flower stems when at the moment of my last breath my throat becomes constricted by the actions of bodily humors air bile and phlegm how will i be able to remember you now if you recall going back to the uh, to, to the beginning of this chapter we uh, one of the important questions that arjuna had asked was how to remember krishna Uh, at the time of death now now uh, krishnakar alwar is saying my body when i'm old uh, may not be in a position to remember you i i may have uh, i will not even be able to chant your name because uh, my 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 throat could be constricted by by bodily humors that's what he's saying air bile phlegm phlegm all this can can prevent me from even chanting your name right we had a discussion in chapter 5 also when when, when we saw about old age right so old age is that moment before death and this is a definition no less given by uh, by a exalted devotee like um, like prahlad maharaj right he is the one who defines old age right old age is the moment before your death right so it can be any time there is no fixed time for old age right it can be at 10 or it can be at 90 the moment before your before one's death is what is called old age this is what um, Mm, prahlad maharaj says right now no one knows when death is going to come for them right uh, so the time to start is now right it is now it's not that we have to be spiritual only when uh, when everything is settled in our lives right that is never going to happen we will always have problems because this yuga is like that right kali yuga is like that yeah uh, there is there no cessation of of troubles there is no cessation of worries but never think that once my worries are over i will go to spirituality if you go to spirituality your worries you can handle that still not be over i told you in the first class itself right what is the purpose of studying bhagavad gita it's like an umbrella right the rain is falling you can't stop the falling of the rain you can hold an umbrella up right to prevent that the the rain from drenching you that is the same message here right the you you have to do it now because you keep it for later that later you don't know what might happen which is what king kulashekar alwar is saying here right he says at, at my later stage i don't know what i will be i i may not be even able to chant your name he is is his grievance right so he says the, the point is this be spiritual now now is the time when you have to exercise your will and surrender to krishna right that is the message here right so concluding shloka uh, of the of the chapter this is 8.28 वेदेशो यज्ञेशो तपस्तु चैव दानेशो यत्पुण्यफल प्रदिष्ट अत्येति तत्सर्विद विदे योगी परम स्थान मुपैति चाद्यम हरे कृष्ण A person who accepts the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, performing austere sacrifices, giving charity or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities at the end he reaches the supreme abode so this is again another assurance from krishna see what happens when you do karma kanda activities right you, you get you do it to get some benefit here krishna is saying that those who are engaged in devotional service it is not as if that they will lose out on the other benefits of the karma kanda activities right so being engaged in devotional service will also attract those benefits which are usually bestowed on the karmis right but then uh, this is better because those benefits are temporary in nature which benefits the benefits that one derives from karma kanda activities those are temporary in nature right so when you are in devotional service you you get that also but you also get the permanent bliss right so so both of these you get that's what krishna is saying so therefore krishna is saying that devotional service is better now another angle look at it from another angle uh, arjuna is a kshatriya right his dharma involves philanthropic activities now if he spends all his time in devotional service how is he going to fulfill that part of his dharma how is he going to give charity because 
if, if you're going to be in devotional service, Krishna says, um, if you're going to be in devotional service, uh, you, you're not materially inclined, right? So Krishna clarifies that if you engage in devotional service, it is not that you will lose the benefits that you would have otherwise have gained if you're a karma kandi, right? So Krishna says you are entitled to both, both temporary uh, benefits and also permanent benefits. So there's nothing to lose when, when you are engaged in devotional service. And these are Krishna's words, huh? not mine. Krishna says that a person who is in the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, performing austere sacrifices, giving charity, or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. Right? So Krishna assures that devotional service, you will not lose out on any other benefits that you would otherwise get when you follow these activities. So you have to understand it like this. When you engage in devotional service to the Lord, it is as if you have already done these things. That is, it is as if you have studied the Veda. It is as if you have uh, performed austere sacrifices. It is as if you are giving charity and all that, right? So the benefits that you have obtained there, merely by performing devotional service, you also get it in devotional service itself automatically, right? So that concludes the chapter. Just a quick overview of what we studied. We, start, we started the chapter with eight questions from Arjuna, right? So the first uh, four, four verses, Krishna answers all the seven questions except for one. And the rest of the entire chapter is about, is about uh, how to remember Krishna at the time of death. We saw the story of Sage Bharata. We saw the story of, uh, of Ajamila. We saw what uh, uh, Yudhishthira uh, mentions as, as the most uh, amazing, uh, the most bewildering uh, thing that is happening in the world, right? Then we saw how, how to remember Krishna through pure bhakti. And then we saw material world versus spiritual world. We saw Goloka chart today. Today's chapter was quite, quite a productive chapter, right? And, and, and we also saw again about the supremacy of pure bhakti in attaining Krishna. We saw that we do not lose out anything, any, any benefits that we would have otherwise gained, uh, but for a devotional service. So a devotional service gives you all the benefits. And that's what Krishna is saying, right? So with that, we conclude today's chapter. Uh, oh, we have, that's of course, that. Om Tat Sat Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Su Upanishad Su Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastre Shri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Akshara Brahma Yoga Nama Ashtamodhyaya Sarvam Krishna Pranamastu Hare Krishna Om Angyana Timirandasi Angyana Anjana Sarakya Chakshuru Milita Mena Tashmai Shri Guru Venamaha Mancha Kalpatru Beshak Rabasan Guru Vedacha Pratitana Pabane Bhu Vaishnavibhyo Namon Namaha. Hare Krishna. Okay, so let's conclude. I stop sharing. Right. So, Ashtagam? Sir, Raj Brahma Samhita, na? Yes, Mataji. So, Jaisi Kannan Mataji will be doing today's Brahma Samhita. Okay, aha. She raised her hand. Yes, Mataji, I made a co-host. Please go ahead. Praya Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Ishwaraha Paramaha Krishnaha Chachidananda Vikraha Anadiradir Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam Chinda Mani Prakara Satamasukalpa Vresha Laksha Pradesh Surabir Abhipala Yandam Lakshmi Sagastra Sadasam Brahma Sevya Manam Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Venam Gwananda Maravinda Talaya Daksham Barahavadam Sam Asidam Buddha Sundarangam Sandar Pakodi Kamaniya Visesha Sobam Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Alola Chandra Ragalas Panamalya Vamsi Ratnangadam Pranaya Keli Kalavilasam Shyamam Trubanga Lalitam Niyata Pradasham Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Govinda Madi Purusham Pamaham Bajami Angani Yasya Sagalendya Vratti Mandi 
पश्यी कलयी शिम जगंदे आनंद चिन्मय सत्ज्वल विग्रह से गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा अत्यदमच्युदम अनादिम अनंद आद्यम पुराण पुषम नवयवन चेदेशो दुर्लभम अदुर्लभम आत्मबद्ध गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा बंदास्त कोड़ी सदवश्चर संप्रभम्यो मनसो मुनिपुंगोमी अस्ति यिमी अविचिंद गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा के गोमी असौ रसयुम जगदंडकोडिम यक्षक्तिरस्ति जगदंड सयाय अंध अंडांद सद परमानु सया तरस्त गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा यद पावतीयो मनुचास्तद संप्य रूप महिमसयान पूज शुक्तम प्रदस्तु वंदे गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा आनंद चिन्मय रस प्रतिमा विदा निज रूप दया कला निवसि अखिलात्मूदो गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा गोविंदमादिपुरशम तमहम भजा राधे कृष्ण प्रभु जी हरे कृष्ण माता जी थैंक यू वेरी मच इट इज वेरी नाइस वेरी प्लेजेंट रेंडेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू प्रभु जी question and answer session now any questions from today's chapter wow two questions okay so one question harshik prabhu yes please go ahead prabhu let me just uh, enable you to unmute yes please go ahead hari krishna prabhu hari krishna uh, yes prabhu ji i have a doubt between two shlokas uh, because their wordings are quite similar Uh, if you can explain them which one uh, uh well, one is 5.29 5.9 5.9 5.29 5.29 5.29 and and uh, 7.30 7.30 yes okay let us see what those shlokas are just give me a moment Okay, so what is the confusion? Let us see. One, just let me just share the screen so that the uh, other devotees are able to um, also know what we are talking about. Right. So this is five point two nine. Okay, Boktaram Yagnata Pasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Right. So a person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities. the supreme lord of all planets and demigods and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attains peace from the pangs of material misery okay so this is 5.29 
and what is 7.30 this is um, okay those in full consciousness of me who know me the supreme lord who know, who know me the supreme lord to be the governing principle of the material manifestations manifestation of the demigods and of all methods of sacrifice can understand and know me the supreme personality of godhead even at the time of death yes prabhu what's your uh, what's your confusion here uh yes i want to know the difference between these two shlokas because the wordings are quite similar uh like uh all methods of sacrifice oh, yes yes that's true that's true because see what happens <laughs> uh, uh, in fact as we go further down uh, down uh, the chapters uh, the, the remaining chapters we still have how many we still have at least uh, eight we were in the eighth chapter today right so tomorrow will be nine and we still have at least 10 more chapters left right or uh, you will find echoes of this initial messages over and over again so there'll be a, quite a lot of repetition and it is because that this message is so important that, that that this repetition is always there because we have to understand see one time you mention it you may not understand right one may not understand so it is that um, you you come to chapter 18 chapter 18 is like the entire bhagavad gita is again narrated in chapter 18 okay so this this sort of a, a repetition is 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 that it is for arjuna's understanding and through arjuna we are also uh, being benefited bro so it is that this is uh, it, it it is definitely repeated yeah you are right so the point is this just understand that krishna is the ultimate enjoyer of all sacrifices that's what is mentioned in uh, in 5.29 also in 7.30 the message is the same you are right okay yes prabhu Yeah, I have another question. Yes, uh, yes, yes, Prabhu. Uh, I, in this verses, uh, no. Okay, then I'll just stop sharing. One, just give me a moment. And actually, you, if you see this, seven point three zero is actually broader in scope. Seven uh, point, sorry, seven point three zero. Yeah, seven point three zero is broader in scope because in five point two nine, the emphasis is on the fact that Krishna is the ultimate enjoyer, right? in 7.30 the focus is slightly different the focus is on the fact that you should think of krishna at the time of death right that is uh, what is the focus on 7.30 so it's slightly different in in that aspect though similar it is still slightly different uh, got it yes prabhu okay can i okay yeah, yeah. what's the other question yes uh is it advisable to consume a medicine uh, which has a animal as it, as its source like it's a non veg medicine it's non vegetarian medicine but medicine no yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, yeah, that amount of altitude uh, is is available but uh, if 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 you are able to find out alternatives for it that that is the ideal situation but if it is not been prevented if if if, if you are not in a position to prevent it then uh, then there's no other way then it's fine but if it's an alternative uh, just explore if there's an alternative and if there's an alternative adopt the alternative because see you you're not keeping one person is not keeping one and therefore it is that he takes medicine right for that matter i give an example ayurveda um, onion and garlic we, have, we we generally say we have to avoid right onion and garlic generally people say we, it should be avoided what is the reason in fact in ayurveda onion and garlic are medicines that the problem is when you incorporate medicine as food that's when the problem starts because they make you tamsik right you you take a quiz before you have onion and you take a quiz after you you, you have onion not a quiz per se but a, but an iq test your second result would definitely be lower than the first result this has been demonstrated amply okay scientifically also so the, that, that's why we generally don't take onion and garlic but then ayurveda treats onion and garlic as medicines if you're taking it in small quantities for its medicinal value it is fine because a person is sick right when you are sick you have to get better kalu shariram kalu dharma sadhanam right body is to be the the um, it's it's supposed to be the instrument for all good things right so in order to get your body back to its prime form it is okay but if there are alternatives available please explore the alternatives i gave this onion and garlic example by by way only of an example okay so it doesn't apply to meat but try and avoid it if it's possible because the sin always attaches whatever see if if you go touch the fire for whatever reason the fire is not going to uh, to to look at your reason and and say okay this person comes from a small uh, he's uh, he's not well therefore i am not going to hurt him it's not going to think like that right 
The fire is always going to hurt you, irrespective of what intention you touch the fire with, right? So meat eating is always sinful, without doubt. But then when you're not keeping well, there is no, uh, no other option. That's, you have to do it. Okay? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. Hare Krishna. Okay, nice thank question. You, nice question. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you, Prabhuji. Not only for the, these answers, for, but for the enlight, enlightening lectures you have been delivering for the past few. Hare Krishna. All glories to Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. And uh, today we will be circulating uh, uh, a feedback form, so to speak, right? So anything that you would like to change in the class, please do let us know so that uh, we would make the the necessary changes because uh, if, if 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 something is um, is can be made better right and uh, if, if i can make if i have to simplify the concepts or if i have to to if this is okay what, what i'm mentioning is okay or, or you want more philosophy uh, please let me know i'll circulate it uh, today itself so please let me know do fill in the form because otherwise i'll not know what exactly is uh, is going on in class right so please let me know about uh, your, your inputs and uh, we'll meet tomorrow. If there are no further questions, any further questions we have? Uh, what about the chat box? Chat box is also clear. Okay, Raghav Prabhuji says he's sorry for the inconvenience cause. That's okay, Prabhu. It's, it's in unintentional. That's all right. It happens all the time. Okay, so that is all. So we can conclude. Hare Krishna. Thank you for joining. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Uh, same time tomorrow, six o'clock. Let's meet for chapter okay. nine. Right? Okay. Hare Krishna.